So I was tempted to ask to talk to you with your stars because I knew it would be hugely entertaining yeah. because they're so entertaining in the movie. Yeah. But I wanted to talk to you okay. about how you made the movie and why you made it the way you made it because okay. it is so different from any movie I've ever seen and gorgeous. Oh, thank you. And the way you shot it enhances the storytelling. So explain how you came to that decision. You shot a movie yeah. on the streets of LA yeah. with iPhones? Yes. Uh, well, you know what? It really did start off as a budgetary thing. It really did. I, 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 people don't really believe us when we say that, but we were stuck with a very low budget. And we... Um, what are we talking? Hundreds of thousands of dollars? Less. And so... We actually, I'm out of favors at this point, I'm on my fifth feature, and I can't really ask for the Alexa or the Red from anybody. We could have shot on one of the DSLRs and one of the 5Ds, but even that would have added crew members, and it would have required certain glass, because I, would, I wanted to separate us from the pack a little bit. And so then I started uh, exploring options such as, you know, the iPhone, just by, there was a Vimeo channel that had all of these iPhone experiments on them, and I... I was very impressed by the look, and I thought, why not? You know, maybe. Well, the this 5S has a, a much higher resolution, yes. right? So yeah, explain that. Yeah, it was the that. first time. I think the iPhone 5S was the first real advancement in in the uh, in, in the chip or in the, in the actual camera in mm -hmm. the video and you know the video function. So it was a uh, so that along with this um, anamorphic adapter, which actually allowed us to shoot real scope. It was this company called Moondog Labs, and I found them through that Vimeo channel. They were, had a Kickstarter campaign. They were in prototype stage at the time. I called them up. I said, I'm making a film, executive produced by Mark Duplass. You might know the name. And they, they did, and I think that that helped me. They, they, they sent me three um, of these prototypes, these anamorphic adapters. They fit over the iPhone lens. And uh, that really elevates it, I think, to a real cinematic uh, level. To the, it was actually allowed. I, I, I was very impressed with their tests. So here's a, here's an iPhone 5s. How, yeah. how would you? How would it look? And how would you okay. use it? You're still using this little lens, but you have an adapter that fits over it and and captures. Uh, the image in a way that's very similar to the way you shoot, you know, shoot anamorphic. It, it, it grabs enough information. When you're looking at it, everything is squished, so you have to imagine what it will look like hmm. when it's stretched out. And we didn't have any external monitors. So are you just this holding our, it like that, or did you have a rig we of had some a, kind? Um, we had a rig. It was a steady cam. Mm -hmm. It was like a little grip because the human hand isn't stable enough. So it is a steady cam. You have to get to know it. It, it takes about a month to actually get used to it. Um, and were you manning it, I as was, it were? I, I co-DP'd it. Radium <laughs> Chung, who shot my previous film, Starlet, um, he wasn't available the first week. He was shooting 35 millimeter on the Americans. Wow. And he came from the Americans to shoot my film on the iPhone. But so I had to, I had to handle the first week, and then we share, you know, we shared responsibility for the rest of the shoot. But both of us practiced with this, this stabilizer. Uh, so that was the second tool, and the third tool was a uh, an app called Filmic Pro, which allowed us to lock it at 24 frames a second. You can control aperture and focus, and so really those three things really uh, I think sold me. Uh, and you also must have been aware because of your background that you could take take it into the lab and have some fun with it. Not the lab, yeah, but we don't use that exactly. word anymore. No, 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 but there was a lot of... Because you play uh, with the colors, clearly you saturate. Pumped up the colors, added, added grain. Uh, we tweaked it a lot in post-production, um, but I had done these tests originally for Mark and Jay and the other financiers, Mark uh, Marcus and Carrie Cox from Through Film, and at one point we went over to Technicolor, we had a favor, and we, were, we threw it up on the big screen and we said, this looks great. There's nothing wrong with this. This can play. It, um, yes, it does look a little lo-fi, and it looks a little rough around the edges, but I think it's appropriate to the story that we're, doing, we're telling. I agree. Yeah, and Mark, It's a gritty story. Yeah, and Mark was the one who basically gave me the last, like, thumbs up. He was like, let's do this. It's like punk rock. And I was like, you know, you're right. Let's do it. 
in a way, it became a selling hook. I know. I Did know. you have any awareness that that would be the case? No. Well, a little bit. A little bit. But it's always good to be first. Yeah, but we didn't know we would be first because I actually went to Sundance thinking we were going to be one of many. Because I just thought it was about time. And hmm. I was expecting another film to have been shot on the iPhone this year. So it was surprising that we were the only one. Well, finally, it wouldn't be um, doing as well as it is, picked up by Magnolia and so forth, if it hadn't been a good movie. So tell me about your trip. I mean, I want to go back to the, to the story itself that you made. But before we do yeah. that, when you took it to, to, just in terms of the look, when you took it to, to you got into Sundance. Yes, yes. And then you must have been like anxious before you showed it. Oh, most definitely. And we didn't also we. I was coming from it. We all were coming from a point of view where if if we were told that a film was shot on the iPhone, we might be a little bit. We might have our doubts. So we didn't actually really want to even. We didn't make a big deal of it. We didn't tell anybody. The critics did for that first. You know, for that first screening. To tell you the truth, everybody found out during the end scroll. It's on the end credits, yeah. yeah. So, um, and then once the word was out, then we started using it as a, you know, a point of interest. But I, uh, I uh, have to say, just going back a little bit, that we were all, the whole team was a little bit apprehensive moving, going into this. We didn't want, we thought, oh, it might be a step back. It, it might be amateur hour. Well, I don't know about this, and and I had to basically tell everybody we have to go into this thinking we're making a real movie. We have to embrace it, and we have to think of it as creating our own aesthetic. Because if not, we would be failing. And but this is a very different aesthetic from the yeah. ones you've employed on your other films. Yeah. You took yeah, a yeah. totally different approach. Yeah, yeah. And you have these. All right. Basically, the premise is that you have these two transgender prostitutes on Santa Monica Boulevard where we all know where right. they hang out right. and it, they're running around and they're yelling at each other and there's a yeah. lot of movement yeah. and how do you use the camera? Well, that was just one of those I think those benefits that sort of revealed revealed itself to us while we were shooting I think it was the second or third day that I realized that uh, we were shooting the scene in which Kiki, I'm sorry, Cindy, the character of Cindy, exits donut time and she goes on her rampage. Well, I wanted it to be dynamic. I wanted it to be a, a shot of adrenaline at that moment. I happen to have my bike there, a 10-speed bike. I used to be a bike messenger in New York, so I'm decent with riding a bike. I, you know, I held onto the handlebars with my left hand and held onto this this steady cam in my right hand and. I just went for that swooping shot where she exits donut time and I showed it to everybody and I said, look, this is, this is interesting. You know, this might be the style of the movie. I think we're finding something here because we can move the camera a lot more than I've been able to move the camera in the past. And get closer. And, yeah, and then everybody was like, this is nice. Well, let's go. Let's continue this. And it became to the point where we are then doing impromptu crane shots and, and just, just, just trying to exploit the iPhone as much as possible. But you were always in service of the dramatics of, of the story. But what you get is this, I don't know how to explain it. You're just with them. You're inside their little zone. You know, it also, it, it, what also I think this was another, it was sort of a forced uh, aesthetic but one that I'm very happy about that, that actually um, is that the fact that we weren't using telephoto lenses. In a lot of these social realist types of films where you're, are looking, back here. You're, you're, you're from a distance and you're observing from a distance. Or an Uberman in Time Out of Mind yeah, yeah. or the, the, that love story. That, what was that? Um, Safdie Brothers film. Oh, do they do that? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and which is beautiful. I love their aesthetic. It's really great. Um, but... What, uh, but I'm also really happy with the way that we were, because of our lenses, we were set at a certain focal point, so we had to actually be in close to our characters, and I think it got the audience in with our characters. Yeah, definitely. And that's what, that was one of those things where I'm re really happy it actually turned out. How did the sound work? Oh, that was, we did it the traditional way. Uh, Iron Strauss was our location sound recordist. He did Starlet. I love him. He's a one-man show, and... He, uh, if any, if you saw us from across the street, you wouldn't know we were shooting a feature film except for the back for our sound gear because we still had the boom pole, we still had the sound cart, 
um, I approached it in a very Robert Altman-esque way, especially donut time. I said, I want everybody mic'd separately so that I can play with what lines I hear in post-production. So he came fully prepared and gave me wonderful sound. Well, the other reason for anxiety, perhaps, is that you have two relatively untried. Yeah. Uh, one is a complete rookie, yeah. Kiki. Right. Well, no, um, Kiki. No, Kiki was actually the one who studied drama in high school. Oh. Maya is the one who only was trained in music. So she was an aspiring entertainer, but not an aspiring actress. The they're way. both really good. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And they're entertaining as yeah. hell. Yeah. Very. So lucky, how did you uh, work with them as far as script and improv and so on? Well, we did. Um, I I honestly approached it in a way where. Uh, in case they weren't that good, I was going to have them with less lines and focus more on the characters around them. But then once I realized that they were so wonderful, I could just, I just, I decided to, to workshop with them. In very similar to the way, you know, Mike Lee's process, I, we had some workshop uh, sessions, a few of them actually, before, before shooting where we were able to flesh out dialogue a little bit more. We would give them dialogue, we would say, this isn't realistic enough, let's throw it out the window and let's put it into the words of you know, how it would sound coming from uh, the characters you're playing and being the fact that Maya and Kiki were very familiar with the area and they had friends who actually worked the area, uh, they were able to do that and they were able to give us notes on everything. Did either of them, because they both um, strike me from what I've seen as sort of proud women, did they have any um, reservations about portraying what could be considered uh, a stereotypical figure in that world. Um, Not that they don't exist, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, no, they didn't. And I'll tell you why. I think they saw my other films, and I think that Kiki bonded or connected a lot with Prince of Broadway. Maya connected a lot with Starlet, and they kind of saw my sensibility. And Starlet they being more about the porn industry, right? But they just knew that we were going to flesh out these characters and humanize them, and that, that we weren't going to take sex workers and show them in a way that I think you see on uh, up to this point where they very been... matter of fact it's very straightforward yeah. it's more about their relationship exactly. and it's important yeah I'm very happy with the way it was resolved very important yeah yes. that was that, their well, that girlfriends was, that scene was um, was one of the first I think images I thought about when conceiving the the plot the entire script it was it was how it was going to wrap up it was how we we were all we were writing with the intention of how we were going to bring them together at the take end take them apart and, yep. and bring them back and then the character of the armenian taxi driver so you're you're basically you're introduced to all these different characters and you're following them around and sometimes they're together sometimes they're apart and you're covering a good swath of the city too by bus yeah it's a whole other area you know that we're not a lot of us aren't familiar with uh, or by train, um, but this guy's in a cab, and you establish him very much, you, you bring our sympathies in with him from the beginning, yeah. and you show some of the more sordid people in his cab, the throwing up scene was hilarious. <laughs> but he, he becomes uh, an integral part of the story too, so you have this whole Armenian side. Well, I've worked with Karin now five times. I love him, he's, he's an amazing actor and can do very, and can do a ton with very little dialogue which he, he, he has a way of just uh, creating a persona and, and allowing the audience to connect with him and identify with him, even without saying much. There's something that he just, just is something about him. He ha He's able to communicate without words sometimes. And uh, I approached him and I said, hey, look, I'm making this film about two transgender sex workers in Los Angeles. I want you to be part of it. How are we gonna work you in? He goes, well, you know, there's a huge Armenian population in L.A. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm aware of that. And he's like, well, make me a cab driver who's into one of them. <laughs> it's like, yeah, there we go. There you go. So how did you come up with the, the, the key scene with him, if, it, if you like, oh, the, is in the car wash. The car wash, yeah. That which was, has a time frame. Yeah, I, uh, I've i always wanted to do a one-shot and a car wash. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. <laughs> and this is, And it just happened to be that... This film allowed for that. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> How many times did you shoot that? Twice. So what was the biggest challenge in terms of how you were doing this for you? How long did you take to do it? The, the biggest challenge, I, I think, was this time around, I have to say, we were wearing many hats. You know, uh, we all had, we didn't have, we had a small, much smaller budget than Starlet. It was almost cut in half. It felt mm. like a step back. Yeah. Um, we weren't, there was a... Uh, and there was also just the emotional sort of, uh, it, was, it, was, it was emotionally taxing on us because of the world that we were working in. I mean, Some of the people are real, right? Some of the people are real. And, uh, and, and did you, I don't know if, you know, but um, just the violence against trans women has even increased in the mm. last, you know, last year. It's gone, the, the violence has increased by 13%. And it's just, uh, it's a very, you your eyes are, even if you're aware of the hardships and, that they're going through, when you're actually working with them on the street, and it's just even more eye-opening. And I just know that after after the film, it, we, we needed a break. I couldn't even edit right away because... The film itself isn't that heavy. It's no, pretty entertaining, no, actually. No, but... You're yeah, laughing. It's but, a comedy. Am yeah. I, is that okay to say? Oh, yeah. I, I, it was actually Maya who actually made me realize that that was how we should approach this film because she was the one who told us I'll make this film if you promise me that it'll be brutally realistic and show how hard it is for the women out here but at the same time I want to laugh and I want this thing to be funny as hell all the way through it and I said Maya that's asking way too much <laughs> that's a balancing act and she gets to sing her song yes that was a caveat of hers so I, uh, I but then I realized what she was saying I realized that these women you humor to cope and when I was hanging out with them doing our research at the, at the Jack in the Box that we were, we were conversing all the time and hearing these stories it was almost like watching stand up they were so funny and just so witty and I thought if I don't if I don't inject this humor into the movie it'll be dishonest you know it really will be um, so the premise is actually the story premise of, of, of the I, I, I have to admit that I found it I mean if you're a sex worker and you have a pin yeah. And you have a relationship with your pimp. Yeah. How much well, do the rules of loyalty we, and fidelity apply? Well, we never really say in the movie that he is her pimp. We never really say that. We say that they're boyfriend, girlfriend, and fiance. Eventually, we never, yeah. yeah. We never say that. They, so, um, but uh, being the fact that he is a pimp for other women in the area, that, yes, what you just said, there's that whole question of, but it's based on a true story. It's based, uh, yes, it is. It is. So it, it's based on um, it's based on a story that never saw it all the way to fruition. Uh, basically, it was being contemplated by one of the girls, and uh, and that's how it came about. Kiki was the one who actually brought it to the table. When we, when I said to her, I said, I don't have much to go on here. I think it's about two people coming together on one night. We have to shoot it in a. It has to take place in one day because of our budget. It has to. I, I don't have the budget to have costume changes, so I think it takes place on one night. It's about people coming together, and that's all. And, and we were spitballing and trying to come up with something for a while, and then eventually she she said to me, "Well, there was this one time where there was a story of a fish," and I said, "What a fish!" And then it went from there. And we realized that that would be a wonderful a plot because not only would it take our characters on a journey, but it was a lot. It was it was layered. You know? It had it was, a lot of drama yeah, attached. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, you start in the daytime where it's bright, yeah. and so the iPhone you had lots of light, lots, lots of, of light, good light. Then when it gets dark, it still looks pretty good. Yeah, it was but what very are you nice. doing? Are you lighting? Um, radium always had this, uh, like uh, portable f uh, fills that he would be, you know, at least giving something to to illuminate to bring up the illumination just a bit. Um, uh, the cabs were the cab the, the cab interiors. They were lit subtly, but they were lit. Um, sometimes he would enhance the practicals a bit, like in the Armenian apartment. But Donut Time wasn't lit. We we told Donut Time that we wouldn't interfere with their business. So they were in coming way. in and out, people, yeah. customers. Yeah, and sometimes, as you, I think there was two two scenes where we actually incorporate real customers. And we just basically said, we're shooting a film, would you mind signing this release? And in both cases, they did. 
So, but I, I was used to that already on takeout, where we couldn't shut down their business for one second. So, Xi Ching and I were already, we already knew how to handle that sort of thing. Well, it turns out that you didn't come from behind at all. You know, you didn't go back. This is yeah. an advance. Yeah, in the end. yeah. You must feel pretty good about I, that. I, I, yeah, I do, and and I'm really. Actually, a little surprised. Well, who knows? The film isn't released yet, so who knows what sort of reaction we'll have with the public. But it's but, timely in a yeah. weird way that you might not have anticipated. No, we either. didn't anticipate that at all. I, I was very. Uh, I, I, I could tell something was brewing two and a half years ago when we started down this road, but I had no idea it would be so much a part of the zeitgeist that it, that it is now. And uh, my hope with Maya and Kiki is that the industry embraces them. It's the right time. There should be more roles for is trans Is there evidence women. of that yet? Yes. Um, Maya actually already just did a short film in which she plays Marsha P. Johnson. She was flown to New York to do it. Um, so all I can do is, is, is hope for more, more of that.